Okay, hello and welcome back to the final session of Online MPI. Uh, and so what we're going to begin with today uh, is we're going to have a little look at the exercise uh, from last week. It's okay if you haven't done it, uh, although we are about to run through the solutions. Let's begin by looking at the uh, the ring, or rotating information around the ring uh, solution. So the exercise here was simply to calculate a cumulative sum uh, across all processes by passing um, just the rank of each process to each other process. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to go to the usual for um, accessing, this, accessing uh, sims and checking the solution on there. Um, all manner of things could and probably will go wrong because such is the nature of these things. Uh, if you do have any issues reading um, the terminal as well, do let me know in the chat. I'll endeavor to do something about it. Um, as usual, I'm gonna gonna blue peter this and pull one out that we made earlier. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, our aim here, as it knows at the top, is to form a global sum of data stored on each pro process by rotating each piece of data all the way around the ring. Um, and at each iteration, the process will receive some data from the left and, and then pass it on to the right. Uh, it's fairly simple setup. The aim here really was to look at non-blocking communications, of course. Um, and we won't take terribly long on this example because it is reasonably short and also because I want to spend a decent amount of time going through collective communications. Um, but I just want to highlight quickly the use of uh, start and stop here um, to abstract away the loop indexes. Or loop indices, I should say. Uh, and also com equals MPI com world, not strictly necessary, but good practice. Set the communicator at the top and just setting a default tag, one in this case. Um, all these things are often worth doing. Uh, we also calculate and remember that every process is doing this independently. We calculate if neighbors left and right of us um, somewhere near the top. So we simply have that information stored. Calculating neighbors uh, is always a challenge for many MPI codes and um, these do things like halo swapping. Uh, in 1D, of course, it's relatively simple. We have two neighbors, but once you start moving up to multiple dimensions, it can get more challenging. Um, we won't cover it in this course, but there are uh, special types of communicators you can construct, which will give MPI some information about its topology and then it has functions which will help you calculate a rank's neighbors um, for you, which is very worthwhile. Um, but we're not worried too much about it here. Here, we simply have a neighbor preceding and a neighbor afterwards, and to left and to the right. And of course, we need to make sure that the periodic boundary conditions are respected here. Uh, this is a fairly brute force way of doing that, but it works. Um, I can reinitialize sum to zero as well. Uh, so here, okay, we're going to be using rank plus one times rank plus one. Uh, that is simply because of this part here. So this is actually just looking at section two. Um, so computing the sum of rank plus one squared. Um, there's nothing special here. So the, the first version of the exercise is here where it simply uses the rank. Um, doesn't matter too much to us. And here is the solution. That's it. Uh, as you can see, it's not it's not super complicated. Um, but what is important here is that these are or this. Ooh, apologies. Uh, that wasn't uh, this is uh, an immediate send, an immediate synchronous send. Uh, so non-blocking communication. Um, Hence, it has a request at the end. Okay, so well, <laughs> I forgot the highlighting is not particularly useful in Vim. 
I misspell that again. Uh, so here we have a request at the end, um, which we can then later test or wait for uh, to ensure that the communication has completed. And in between, we perform the receive. Uh, and this means that all of our communications around the ring happen more or less simultaneously, um, rather than having to stagger sends and receives to avoid deadlock as we would using blocking communications. Um, so the only uh, overlap we've achieved here is to put the receive in between the uh, the IS send and the wait. Uh, can anyone suggest in the chat what else we could, how we could rearrange or refactor this this loop here um, in order to achieve a little bit more overlap? Not a huge amount, I must say, because this is a fairly um, simple example. But here it could be done. Anyway, I've got my guesses. It's all, all quiet in the chat. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll give you the answer then. So there's only, I mean, there are only two other things in this loop, right, that you could possibly move. And the one that it would be safe to um, move into the overlap region is, is this summation line. So that could go there. Um, I just want to take a minute to, to examine why that is the case. So what's key here is that this NPR receive, this is still a blocking communication, uh, a blocking call. So add-on is safe to use as soon as that receive exits. And that means we can do sum equals sum plus add-on safely because we know that add-on is fine. Um, on the other hand, pass on, uh, which we've sent, we don't know that, that it's safe to reuse that buffer until after this MPI wait is completed. So when the MPI wait exits, we know that that, well, that non-blocking communication has completed successfully and the buffer is safe to reuse and pass on, and therefore is reusable. Uh, so this pass on equals add-on has to come after the MPI wait, but this line sum equals sum plus add-on um, or some plus equals add-on uh, can come before that because it doesn't care about the pass-on buffer. Um, it simply needs that receive to have completed. So you can actually you could move that up in between, and that would be fine um, because this is a blocking communication. So I hope that's clear. Um, I think really that's that's all I want to say about this. Uh, All I want to say about this example, and um, just to check that all that I'm saying is true. Let's try compiling and running it. Uh, is the make file going to be? Hmm. Oh, no. Okay, so I, I might need to modify the make file a little bit. We'll check. However, I do need to do this. Uh, no, let's not even bother. Try it. Okay. An MPI run. Okay. Uh, and let me check the formula. I believe that has worked fine. Um, uh, four times five is twenty. Times nine. 180 divided by 630. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's all worked perfectly correctly, even though I've moved the um, uh, that last part and just a little bit more of that. Now, in this example, it, it's you know that will make almost no difference to the runtime whatsoever. But you can see that you know the more you can get in between here and here, the better, generally speaking. Um, and what matters is whether or not you need the buffer that you are either sending or receiving. And if you don't, then you can put it in the overlap region, and you, you should. Because then if this has already completed, then this MPI wait will um, take almost no time at all. It will simply go, yep, yeah, you're good. MPI will free the resources uh, that it's held, and your program will continue. Um, so it's always a good idea to fit as much as you can in between. 
uh, in order to create efficient uh, MPI programs. And the other, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this last week, although I should have, uh, the other big reason to use non-blocking communications is to prevent serialization um, of your code. What I mean by that is if you're not careful, then you can write a perfectly valid um, synchronous blocking MPI code that it is effectively running, although distributed, effectively running in serial. So one process will do a thing, the next process will do a thing, the next process will do a thing, but it won't be doing anything in parallel, and you're you're losing many most of the benefit of using MPI. Um, you're just running a distributed serial code, uh, which isn't really advantageous. Um, using non-blocking communications can help to to make sure that's not the case by overlapping. Um, regions of, of the code and of the program. Okay, um, so with that said, I'll walk back out of service. And come to today's actual lecture, um, which is uh, yeah. collective communications. Hooray. So, what we've looked at so far is point-to-point uh, -point communication, uh, simply sending from one process to another process um, in both its blocking and non-blocking form. What we're going to look at today, collective communications are communications that involve an entire communicator. Um, I was careful to say an entire communicator there because these operations always act on a communicator, but it does not have to be the MPI com world. Um, now that said, I believe I mentioned last week, but, or two weeks ago now, that MPI does not expect you to operate in such a way that you create many, many <laughs> sub-communicators. It expects a few or a handful of communicators to exist, not thousands, uh, so do be a bit wary of that. But uh, collective communications exist in order to do communication across an entire uh, communicator, and there are several, and much in the same way that we have for previous lectures, what we're going to do here is simply go through um, each of the different types. Uh, I'm going to do it hopefully quite slowly and carefully. And as ever, do stop me if you have any questions. Um, so it's communication involving a group of processes, and it's called all the processes in a communicator. So examples are, and the ones we're going to go for, in fact, are barrier synchronization. Uh, which is really the simplest um, broadcasts, scatters, and gathers, and then things like global sums. Um, so these are different types of reduction operation. Um, see more on that, more on what that means in a minute. Now, one thing I will say about collectives is, um, as a rule, it is good to avoid having to do collective communication. Uh, in, in any program, because it is a communication across an entire communicator, it's fairly heavyweight. And, you know, especially if you're looking at a program that's maybe running thousands of, uh, of MPI processes, even hundreds of MPI processes, you know, if they all have to communicate, it will take a while. Um, it may well be a bottleneck in your code. That said, okay, if your algorithm requires that you have to do this, Okay, whatever you're implementing requires that you have to do this, then do use the MPI collective communications to do it. Don't be tempted to implement your own point-to-point uh, -point solution instead, because it will not be better. Uh, at one time when collective communications were very new, um, it was possible that they were just using point-to-point -point communications underneath. Now that is certainly not the case. You know, the, quite well optimized for what they're doing. Um, they'll often use specific topologies for the communication. Um, you know, so do use these functions if your your code demands it. Okay, don't don't try and get around it by um, doing things that seem clever with point to point communications, uh, mostly because they probably won't scale. Um, in the way you would like them to, or in the same way. So with that said, uh, 
characteristics of collector communications, action over a communicator, uh, all the processes must communicate. So you can't call a collective communication from a subset of processes on your communicator. Okay, that code will deadlock um, because they will wait for the other processes to reach that collective that never comes. Uh, okay, it is over the entire communicator always. Um, and indeed, that, that's an important thing to watch out for is you must make sure that all processes call the collective communication in order for it to happen. Um, or your code will deadlock. Uh, now, synchronization may or may not occur, having just said that. This, I appreciate this confusing. What that really means is some collective communications do synchronize. In the case of the barrier, that's, that's its purpose. That's what it's there for, is to synchronize your processes. But although they all have to call the collective communication, that does not mean they are synchronized. For example, consider the case of a reduction onto a single process. Okay. Um, now, for that to occur, so every process has to send some value to rank zero, say, is what I mean by that. And then rank zero will add them all up. Uh, so it's a reduction operation of some, a global sum of some value onto a single process. In that instance, Okay, every process has to call that collective communication, but they don't necessarily all do it at the same time. And the only one that has to wait for them all to have done it is the root process. Uh, so the process is actually gathering all the data and then summing it. That one cares about what everyone else is doing, but all the others individually, once they've sent their part, they can move on. So in that case, they are not synchronized. Mm -hmm. Although they have all still been involved in and done their part, um, only one process has to wait for the entire collective to finish. And that is the route in that instance. It varies from, from collective communication to collective communication. I'll try to remember to point out which ones do and don't synchronize and hopefully will be correct when I do so. Um, standard collective operations are blocking. Uh, Non-blocking was, and it says recently introduced into MPI 3.0. I'm just going to briefly break out of the presentation for a second here to put that into context. <laughs> so here you can see this is the MPI Forms website, um, kmpiforum.org. And 3.0 was standardized and fully implemented as of 2014. Uh, so Josh is asking in the chat, is the collection all done on one node? Um, for one of the reduction operations, yes, that is the case. So there are a few different kinds. Um, but for a, a simple MPI re reduce operation, yes, the aim there is to, is to collect a global sum onto one node. Uh, there is also a different function called MPI all reduce that gives the global sum to every, uh, every node or every process uh, in the communicator. Um, and we will talk about both in a bit. Uh, so I guess the answer is, well, it depends. Um, so yes, uh, as you can see, although it says here uh, that non-blocking communications are recently introduced, recently here means um, it was fully implemented across almost all libraries five years ago. <laughs> so actually the most recent standard uh, that is complete and fully implemented is 3.1, uh, and then work is ongoing on MPI 4.0. Um, and just to, to toot EPCC's horn a little bit, uh, I just thought I'd show off this. This is the MPI forums uh, GitHub, which they use to, to monitor issues, and recently um, persistent collective communications uh, passed its final vote. Uh, Persistent communications are, if you know that you're going to be doing the same communication again and again and again throughout your code, you can actually set it up at the start. Um, an MPI, instead of ditching all the information about that communication after every send and receive, will retain it. And you can say, OK, do this communication again with this buffer, um, if it's always the same two processes involved, for example. 
uh, and persistent collectives were simply the extension of that idea to collective communications. Um, as you can see, work started on this in 2015. And uh, it was started by Tony Shelton, who is from the University of Chattanooga, Tennessee, I believe. Hope that's correct. Um, but you can also see that Daniel Holmes, uh, one of my colleagues, was heavily involved in this. And it was actually last week um, that he was away at the MPI forum. Um, and this thing that he's been working on with Tony Skelm or Shellum uh, has now passed its final vote and will be in the MPI 4.0 standard. Um, so MPI, although it's stable and um, and you know has been around a while now, quite mature library, uh, is constantly growing. Um, and this is just one of the new things that will be in it soon. Uh, and EPCC is involved in that. So you might recognize Dan if you read this blog, which I highlighted the other week, uh, about what is MPI and working for, which is very timely. OK, so that was a brief uh, divergence. And thank you for indulging me. <laughs> so non-blocking versions of collective operations also exist. Um, that said, OK, they're not even yet. So this was five years ago uh, that, it, that it was recent. Um, but I think this is possibly still true. They're not yet commonly employed. Um, the advantages of doing, because many of them synchronize anyway, the advantages of doing uh, non-blocking collective communications is less obvious. Although it certainly still exists. I think actually the main thing is probably that um, for performance reasons, people typically avoid algorithms that require uh, heavy usage of the collective operations. So because they're avoided anyway, um, there's less incentive to try and optimize them further because they appear minimally in your code and there's probably other things you can focus on. Um, but yeah, that doesn't mean don't use them. Do if you if you have a use case for it. If you so you can overlap with the collective operation, um, I don't see why not. Uh, and the extension is, is as you'd expect, is simply an extra request parameter, uh, as there is for non-blocking point-to-point communications. Um, collective communications don't have tags. Uh, I hope the reason is fairly obvious is because every process is involved. Well, in every process in the communicator must be involved. So there's no reason to match against tags because all processes are going to be getting in on it. Um, so you don't need to worry about matching. Uh, and receive buffers must be exactly the right size. OK, uh, so you might have, eagle eye viewers may have noticed that I have quite transparently got a whole load <laughs> of MPI um, uh, man pages essentially open in my browser right now. Um, that is largely because this parameter count is important. And it's slightly different between the different collective communications. So to avoid tripping myself or you up, I've simply opened the man pages so that I can refer to them as, as we discuss those. Uh, but the receive buffer must always be exactly the right size. Um, and you must remember which process, therefore, is going to be on. Or simply create them the right size everywhere. There's nothing, nothing to stop you doing that. Um, but for some of the collective communications, not every process will need a receive buffer necessarily. Um, it's not sure. OK. Um, I'll just keep an eye on the time. Uh, we're going to till 3, I believe. Um, so the first collective communication I want to introduce is a barrier. Uh, a barrier does basically exactly what you, you might think it does. Um, no process may proceed past the barrier, so it will block uh, until every process has reached it. Okay, it only takes one argument, therefore, it's, it's the communicator um, that you want to carry out the barrier across. So this is, generally speaking, <laughs> frowned upon. <laughs> I, I wouldn't expect a real production code to be making use of barriers uh, as a general rule, unless um, 
it was for profiling purposes. So that's that's the place where you, you really might need it is if you want to time a particular region of the code. Um, but fundamentally, stopping all the processes until some criteria has been reached so, and making them all wait is not a useful thing to do um, for performance uh, or for scalability. Um, so, because this is obviously a very costly operation, you know, uh, to synchronize all your processes. So, you need to have a good a good reason for doing so. Um, there's often a temptation to to write, especially when you're writing the first version of a parallel code, to insert lots of barriers and to effectively serialize your code because it makes it easier to understand, but uh, it also makes it run horribly, and it is not a good way to to do these things. So, um, the MPI barrier certainly has its uses, but you know it's it's not good for efficiency or performance, and I wouldn't expect to see it in a in a proper um, code that's not just using it for timing, for example. Okay. Um, but I hope that one's reasonably clear. I will move on. So the next one. The one that is somewhat more useful um, is MPI broadcast. Okay, so the broadcast, uh, again, hopefully it's reasonably clear what, what I'm about to say. Uh, it simply sends some buffer to every single um, every single process. Now, what's key here is that and a common extra argument that you'll find in collective communications is this one here, the root. Okay, so that's the process from which the data will actually be sent. Um, the broadcast is sending some data across the entire communicator, but obviously at least one process needs to already have that data, and this will be the root process um, from which all data is sent. Uh, here, is, here is your communicator. MPI data type, as you'd expect, now works exactly like it does in point to point as does uh, the buffer. Okay, so the buffer is simply the send buffer here. Um, and the count does exactly what it does in the point-to-point -point communications again. Uh, so there should be, in that buffer, count of data type. Uh, so 10 doubles, three integers, and so on, uh, or even just one uh, character, for example. Okay. Uh, should be in that buffer. Now, what you might be wondering, however, is every process, every rank, needs to call MPI broadcast. So, what do they put <laughs> in here? Um, now, the answer is essentially whatever you like. It's only significant on the root process. Uh, that said, there is a particular reason to make it any different from what the root process has in there. Um, you know, if you've just declared your buffers somewhere near the top, or pointers to the buffers or whatever, uh, somewhere near the top of your code um, before, without forking it in any way, uh, then every, every rank will have access to a buffer that looks like the right thing, and they can simply put that in there. Um, there's no reason to, to fork that. Um, and write it differently for the root process versus every other one, uh, because every process does need to call MPI broadcast, okay, not just the root. Um, and in fact, in the broadcast case, I just realized, of course, uh, and some of you may have worked that ahead of me even, um, that that's absolutely what you should do, because this will be the receive buffer. <laughs> for all other processes. Uh, so I thought I'd take back what I said about these not being significant. That is for a different uh, type of collective communication. Uh, on the root process, this is a send buffer. On every other process, it is the receive buffer. Okay. Um, and it should have space for count of data type if it's receive, and it should be count of data type if it is a send. Um, and root specifies from where it's being sent. Um, okay. And the Fortran uh, is much like the Fortran always is. It has this IR uh, 
argument at the end in order to have the equivalent of the integer return from the C function. And let's just switch over to here. Yep. So here you can see count is in MPIB cast number of entries in buffer. Okay. Um, it'll be more of this why I'm highlighting that shortly. Okay. So that's MPI broadcast. Apologies, I'm mixing up a little bit there. Uh, Chris Stewart is asking in the text chat, is there a requirement for every receiver to receive the full buffer sent by the route? Um, the answer is yes, in the case of MPI broadcast. Um, what we're about to look at is a slightly different collective communication where that is not the case. It's a good question. Uh, the answer is yes for broadcast, but there are other operations for doing what, what you're thinking about. Um, and so actually another thing I should say about broadcast as well is that uh, it's another one of the operations that generally we would suggest avoiding, um, you know, because it is it is sending some amount of data to every single process, uh, it will have an impact on performance. And, and often you don't need to do a full broadcast because okay, you're replicating the data across every every process there. Um, and that's actually not often useful. Uh, in particular, compared to the next thing, which is an MPI scatter, and this is this is what does what you're thinking of, Chris. Um, so that takes some some array, uh, some set of data from some root process, and scatters it across the entire communicator. So in an example here, we have some character array with A, B, C, D, E. Um, and that is split across our five processes. So rank zero has A, rank one has B, rank C has uh, rank three has C, two has C, rank three has D, rank four has E. Got there in the end. Um, and one thing that's important is that that scattering process includes the root. Okay, so it will it will essentially copy um, from the send buffer to the receive buffer um, one part of that array even on the root uh, process, uh, which is fine. It's certainly what you want. Um, in case there is a small amount of duplication data, but otherwise it is scattered uh, to all other processes. And this is a much more useful pattern than broadcasting, generally speaking. Um, half the point of often of using message passing uh, parallelism is that you can split your problem up uh, across many machines. So it's not necessarily useful to simply replicate the data exactly across all of them. And instead here, you can simply send parts um, around the communicator. Okay, and the call signature here, they're somewhat more complicated. We have a send buffer, um, a send count, okay, and the MPI data type for the send type, and then a receive buffer, a receive count, an MPI data type for the receive type. Uh, the root again is important, um, and the communicator across which the collective communication is happening. Um, now you might wonder why do I need to specify the data type twice? It should be the same. Uh, I think basically just so that this mirrors. Um, the way that point-to-point -point communications operate, right? So it, you know, you specify for both. Uh, in principle, it allows you to be flexible uh, about that as well. Although doing so would, of course, be risky um, and may cause errors, as we discussed previously. Um, but yes, they certainly should just be the same. Uh, now, here's where I'm going to check. So the send count is the number of elements sent to each process, okay? And receive count is the number of elements in the receive buffer. What is important is that your send count uh, or your send buffer, sorry, contains 
the same number of, uh, or is large enough to contain one of each data type, or one data type for each process. Okay, you need to make sure that um, the size of your buffer is equal to the send count times the number of processes. Uh, if it's not, it will say fault because MPI is expecting you to have done the right thing. So you tell it, I'm sending um, three integers to each process, and there are 10 processes. It assumes that your send buffer has 30 integers in it for it to do that. Um, otherwise, there will be problems, or at least it, you know, it assumes that it is at least 30 integers. Because of course you can, if you have some very large array, you can, you're welcome to send an address in the middle and it will simply read from that point. But yeah, so all, you know, the same conditions that apply to point-to-point -point communications apply here, um, but it's important that your send count reflects the size of this, this send buffer. Uh, and equally, um, ideally, they should match. Okay, so you should, if you're sending three integers, you should say, I'm expecting to receive three integers but you can have more. Okay, so you can have a receive buffer that's got uh, 10 integers worth of space, uh, and that would be fine, but less would be bad. Okay, yeah, much like with the point to point communications. Um, but I hope that makes sense. I appreciate it is, you know, it, I mean, even for me, <laughs> remembering which counts refer to which thing can be tricky, um, but it's important to make sure that everything matches up um, or you will run into problems. But I hope that's all reasonably clear. Um, do let me know if it's not. Um, so next, okay, I want to talk a little bit about the inverse operation, which is a gather. Okay, and here, uh, again, as you might expect from the name, we're assuming that on uh, some rank, some root uh, process, mm. which I should say as well, and I, I definitely mentioned this last time because the you know, question was asked about it. Um, this would often be uh, rank zero, but it doesn't need to be uh, at all. So no rank is special in MPI. Um, the only thing that is slightly special about rank zero is it is the only one that is guaranteed to exist uh, no matter how many processes are launched. So if you're looking at writing code that um, you know scales across any number of processes, if you wanted to run on uh, one process, you have to make sure that um, the rank zero is your specified for doing certain tasks because rank one simply won't exist uh, more than a greater number. But these scatter and gather operations can in principle take any um, any rank as their root. Um, and indeed it may be necessary for your for your code. That is the case. Okay. Um, so the gather operation will collect from every process some amount of data and store it in a single receive buffer on the root process. Uh, the syntax for the calls shouldn't be overly surprising. Ooh. So Chris Stewart's answered the question in the text chat. Uh, it was definitely covered in previous sessions. Are the ranks in a ah? So uh, yes. <laughs> so he's asked, if, are the ranks in a communicator always from zero, uh, or do subset communicators have ranks not necessarily starting from zero? Uh, the answer is that they always start from zero. So if you create a sub communicator, it will uh, relabel the ranks accordingly because the labeled so the rank number only applies um, within a communicator outside of a particular communicator the rank id is meaningless um, so mpi com world contains every process that is launched going from zero up to how n minus one uh, where n is the number of processes launched any sub communicator that you create will also go from zero up to n minus one, uh, where n is the number of processes in the sub communicator, but zero will still be there. 
So you can create a subcommunicator with only one process, and that process will be ranked zero within that subcommunicator. And um, so Marsh has also asked a question. She's asked, uh, Gala collects a specific process, not necessarily zero. Is this true for scatter and broadcast too? Uh, it's not necessarily from rank zero process. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so in both cases, they have uh, root. I'm pointing at my screen. That's not very helpful. <laughs> they have root uh, as an argument. Okay, And that is the process from which the broadcast takes place. Um, and scatter has root, and that is the place from which the, the scatter takes place. Uh, broadcast and scatter are similar. <laughs> so Marta says, thanks, somehow in their head, uh, root was zero. And um, that's not, I mean, that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, often it would be rank zero for the reason that rank zero always exists, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, you can specify root as being uh, whichever rank suits. Um, but very often it, it would be zero. So the only one that doesn't have any kind of root argument is the barrier, and that's because it simply doesn't matter because it is all processes in the communicator um, will be stopping and waiting there, and they're not sending anything or receiving anything, um, so it's irrelevant. But everything else has a root that specifies where it's coming from or going to. In the case of gather. Um, so here we have a send buffer, a send count, a data type for the send, a data type for the receive as well. Again, uh, could be different, probably should not be ever. <laughs> the, I, no, I can't think of a good use case. I can think of ways you could make use of that, but not any that you should. <laughs> There's a receive buffer and a receive count, and the receive count should match the size of the receive buffer. Um, which may not necessarily be uh, the size of what's being sent, but should be at least as big as what's being sent. Um, a root process and the communicator to which all this applies. Um, the Fortran syntax is almost the same, but as IRA. Um, and again, and I hope this isn't too annoying to people, I'm going to jump out and just highlight you know, the, the manual here. Send count number of elements and send buffer. Uh, receive count number of elements for any single receive. And the reason that that's important um, is that okay, that's the wrong thing. Okay, you are sending uh, some buffer, which has say ten integers, but the receive count is going to be uh, one, for example, if you have ten processes. Um, let me check this right. However, you, yeah, does not work. Ah, I see. Sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Um, yeah, so if you're gathering. 10 integers into an array of 10, uh, then this would be one, okay? Because you're sending one integer from each other process. And then on root, you should have um, receive count would also be one, but your receive buffer, your receive buffer must be 10 integers large or you will run into problems. Yeah. Yeah. So, Whereas before it mattered that your send buffer was the correct size, I mean, it should still be the correct size, but um, MPI is only going to look at send count of it. Uh, however, the receive buffer, it simply trusts that, that is large enough. Okay. Um, so if you have 10 processes in your communicator in MPI.com world um, and you're sending one integer from each, uh, the receive count will also be one because it's receiving one integer from every process, but the receive buffer needs to have space for all 10. Um, and do keep in mind as well that it does always include the root. So here you can see we're, we're going the inverse of our previous scatter problem, where it's A, B, C, B, D. And we still need space for B, even though that's on the root process. Okay. 
Um, and uh, so I hope that's clear. <laughs> and, uh, it does it does take some getting used to to make sure that you know the sizes are all correct here. I mean, generally speaking, the golden rule is that you know send and receive sizes. So if send and receive count should match. Um, but it's a little bit counterintuitive that it's no longer necessarily the size of your buffer, um, and that the buffer needs to be significantly larger. Um, okay. So next, we're going to come on to global reduction operations. Um, so, so far, we've looked at barrier, which simply pauses all processes in the communicator and says, wait here until everyone has reached this point, and then continue. We've looked at broadcast, which simply sends some data to every single process. Um, scatter, which is a slightly smarter approach of sending a bit of some data to every, uh, or part of some data to every process, um, and gather, which is its inverse. Now, those are all reasonably useful. Um, however, probably the most useful uh, and the most widely used collective communications are reductions, because it is a very common pattern that we need to, for example, calculate a global sum uh, or a global maximum of the whole product, or indeed sum of a global value of a set of data that are distributed across our entire machine um, or across our entire communicator. Uh, and that's what the reduction operations are for. Um, they use the compute result involving data distributed over a group of processes. And one thing that's key about this um, as well is that this allows you to so you could do this simply by um, gathering all that data and then on a single process you know, computing whatever property of it you needed to do. Uh, this will actually let you combine um, both operations into one uh, communication. And because you know, you're saying to MPI, this is what I plan to do, it means the implementation has some freedom to try and actually optimize that process. So for example, if you are computing a global sum uh, across a distributed you know, network of computers, um, the most efficient approach, efficient approach is not actually simply to um, send it all to one process and then have that process sum it all up. Okay, that, that's essentially the worst possible approach that you can take. Um, what you can instead do is calculate partial sums at intermediate points in the network. Um, because of the property of summation, we'll, we'll speak about it in a minute. Um, and you have a kind of tree-like network where two nodes, for example, two, uh, two ranks will communicate with one another, add up their bit, and then that will be sent on uh, to a different process, which will receive from a couple of sets. And add up, and they'll fan out in that way in order to to, keep, you know, to compute partial sums as they go. Um, and the MPI library is able to, to take advantage of approaches like that instead, which are much more efficient uh, than simply doing a gather and then a sum. Um, so again, if you if you do need to do an operation that looks a lot like this, and it is a common one. Um, do make use of the collective operations to do it because they are optimized. There is more going on under the hood than simply it being the obvious thing. Um, and actually, there's even, uh, uh, I apologize, I'm going off piece slightly here again. Uh, there is even research uh, ongoing as part of one of the projects I'm involved in, in fact, Epigram HS, um, on doing compute in the network. So for the approach I just described, where different sets or different pairs of nodes will calculate partial sums. Um, that would still often require the involvement of the central uh, processing unit of a particular um, node. So assuming we have some distributed uh, machine like Archer, for example, or indeed Cirrus, uh, you still need to wake up the main, the main processor to do that summation. Uh, one of the things that Epigram HS is looking into is doing compute in the network and thereby actually um, 
uh, doing those summations using the networking hardware instead uh, and avoiding having to wake up the main CPU on a particular node. Um, but okay. The point is that these reduction operations are optimized and you may use them. Um, how do they work? Well, there's a, a predefined set of reduction operations, uh, which are things that are generally useful and commonly used. So calculating the maximum, calculating the minimum, uh, a summation product, uh, simply multiplying all numbers together, uh, logical and, bitwise and, Logical or logical blah, 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 various logical operations and bitwise operations, um, and the maximum and minimum location. Oh, sorry, the maximum and minimum and where they're located. I see. Okay, so that'll be assuming you have some distributed array. Um, it'll let you know both what the max value is and where it is in that in that distributed array. Yeah. Uh, so there's a set of predefined ones that just exist for you to make use of. Um, however, if you require something more fancy, uh, we'll come on to that in a minute. <laughs> First, let's have a look a little at the MPI reduce um, syntax. So this is the, the more simple case where I simply want the result on a single node or a single process, I shouldn't say, uh, or a single rank even. Um, so I'm performing some reduction across my entire communicator. Um, I'm adding up every rank's local value, but I want the result on just one single rank. Okay, that is where the MPI reduce comes in. Okay, it has a send buffer uh, and a receive buffer. Um, okay, and every and every rank needs to specify both of those. Um, but and let me check I'm getting this right this time yet. Yeah. However, you know, these aren't necessarily equally important across all ranks um, because it's being received into a single uh, because it's being received into a single uh, root process. And um, so there's also count and here you'll notice that it's actually unified this time okay so this is assuming that you're reducing the size of the thing that you're uh, reducing will be the same in both the receive and the send um, so you can't try and reduce uh, 10 for example 10 integers and if you need to calculate a global sum of arrays of 10 integers, you would have to reduce it using this operation into a 10 integer array and then calculate the summation of that array separately uh, using the MPI reduce operation. Okay, so the send buffer and receive buffer need to be the same size here. Um, and if it is more than one, so if you're not simply calculating the reduction of a scalar, um, what you will get is the reduction of each array element, okay, in your in your array. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, as usual, we have the MPI data type. Uh, we also have then the operator. So this would be MPI sum for uh, a summation. Uh, MPI prod is a prod. MPI prod for the product, and so on and so forth. The root, so the process where you're expecting the result to actually end up, um, and the communicator you're reducing across. Um, and as uh, ever, the Fortran syntax is almost exactly the same. Uh, but yeah, so what's key here uh, is that this count now counts for both the sending and the receiving buffers, uh, and that's because if you have an array there instead of a single single value, um, it will calculate the element-wise reduction. Okay, and you'll end up with an array with the reduction of each element across your entire communicator um, in each position in the receive buffer. Okay, and I'm just conscious of the time again here. And um, let me just check. Yes, three elaborate time. Okay. So 
just before we go to the break then I'll show off this, this diagram illustrating that. Um, okay, so here we have sets of, of four, uh, of arrays of four um, uh, elements. Okay, it doesn't matter what they are, but we're reducing A, E, I, and N. Again, I'm pointing on help to it on the screen. A, E, I, and N. Okay, they will be reduced um, into the first element uh, of the receive buffer on on the root process. Okay, uh, and only the root process. So nothing will be written into the receive buffers of the other ranks. And the root doesn't have to be zero; it could be any process. Okay, but equally B, F, J, and N will be written into the second element, uh, or be reduced into the second element on the root process. Um, okay, and I think I'll I'll start the break there. Uh, I've just thrown quite a lot at you. I think um, we'll continue and finish off this lecture. Uh, I'll, as I usually do, run through the practical quickly after that. You're also free uh, to simply email me at a later date if there's anything you would like to know. Um, okay, and with that. Hello, and welcome back to this, the final session of online MPI. Um, we're going to be carrying on with uh, the collective communications lecture. Um, but in the break, Marja and Chris have, have asked two very good questions. Uh, so we'll respond to those first. Okay. So um, Martha asks, what uh, what is the count in MPI reduce? Um, is it the count for every single send that is sending towards the reduce operation? Uh, so, and I apologize if I if I made this less clear rather than more clear. And um, so, MPI reduce is is the one that has only one count. Um, okay, and it is the count. Is the count is the size in a number of data types. So number of integers, if it's integers or doubles, if it's doubles, and so on, um, of both the send and receive buffer. Um, so what actually gets sent uh, is in fact that number of items from each process as well, because in reduces case, okay, if you have some vector of say ten integers, just the usual example to going with, um, then or some array, I should say, not vector, of, uh, of 10 integers, then what you will end up with on your root process is also an array of 10 integers. Um, and each element in that array will be the reduction operation of that element across all processes. Okay. Um, so the count then is the number of elements in that array. Uh, if it's a single value, um, then it's just one. Uh, so if you're just calculating the sum of a single number across all processes, then that count would be one. However, if you want to calculate the sum of 10 different integer values or 10 different double values um, across all processes, then it would be 10. Okay, and it doesn't, you know, that's okay, Marta, so hopefully that's answered that one. Uh, and it doesn't need to relate to the number of processes in any way, I should say as well. Um, now, Chris then asked uh, for MPI reduce, since we haven't given uh, the root process uh, a buffer to hold all the data that we'll receive at once um, for storing things like intermediate values, and this is a very good question as well, um, where does all that data end up that gets fired at it? Um, now, in the case of reduce, so the point here is that we have a single root process that is gathering up information or data from across the entire communicator. 
Um, and all those individual communications are hidden from you. Uh, so I, I believe the answer, Chris, will be that yes, those values will go into the receive uh, or into some into like NPI buffer space that it sets aside for doing this before it gets added in uh, or reduced into the receive buffer, because um, that can only happen once at a time. And obviously, if multiple processes all send at the same time, uh, there could be some sort of collision. However, um, one thing that's important to remember is that MPI is almost certainly not doing the naive thing, which is to simply have every single uh, process, okay, every single process send its local calculation straight to the root process. Okay, so it's not if you have a thousand processes on the go, 999 of them are not all suddenly just going to try and message process zero. Um, instead, it will use some kind of network topology to, to split up uh, the reduction operation throughout the network so that actually to avoid contention um, for exactly this reason, so you don't just flood the MPI buffer on a single process. That's one of the reasons why um, those sorts of optimizations are actually very important and why it's better to use collective operations than to simply implement, implement this yourself. Um, but it means that you won't have every process suddenly trying to send to the same one. Um, so stuff will end up in an MPI buffer, but not for long, uh, as it should quickly be able to be uh, reduced into the receive buffer. But under the hood, MPI will just make use of its own buffer space. Yeah. So hopefully that all makes sense as well. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, so as I say, that keeping track of because the the counts are different for each of the collective operations, and um, keeping track of them can be tricky. And and my advice is not to try and simply. Uh, just remember and get it right all the time unless you're using these functions regularly just just check <laughs> the, the main tricky uh, one is is the scatter and gather because here you have um, unlike many others you have a, a, a receive buffer or a send buffer and um, that is a different size from the actual things that are getting sent and received uh, and that's where the, the mismatch comes in and why it can be confusing and um, the golden rule is that MPI is interested in what is being sent and received, uh, more so than it is the buffer. It assumes the buffers are large enough, and if they're not, that's your problem. Um, and it will fail. Uh, so another uh, reasonable question you might ask then is why does MPI never check these things for you? Um, and the, the short answer is scalability. And, to an extent, we've kind of skirted around this. Um, oh, I've got to fire it. Uh, we skirted around this issue in the previous lectures as well, uh, looking at exactly the same thing, looking at the count size and data types and all this kind of stuff. You need to specify for MPI. You know, why can't I just check these things to make sure they're correct? Um, the simple reason is that when you scale up to many, many processes, uh, at that point, you would spend so much time checking everything that you would actually struggle to get the useful bit done. Um, it would kill performance at, at high high numbers of processes if you always had to check that whatever you were sending into was large enough. Um, and indeed, that there was a receive post of all those things that it could, in principle, do for you that it simply doesn't. Um, it relies on your code being correct. Uh, it's all to do with allowing uh, performance and scalability, which are at the core of, of MPI's mission. Um, as a, uh, a standard. Okay, um, so we'll have a look at an example uh, global reduction here. Uh, this is just using MPI reduce. Uh, so it is uh, performing a reduction operation onto rank zero of a single integer. Okay, so the buffer is x uh, for the. Let me get this right. Uh, yes, so the send buffer is X, 
the receive buffer as a result, which makes sense. Um, these do need to be, so results in X need to exist. They need to be declared on every rank that is to work. Okay. Um, however, your result, you know, by the time this operation completes, um, result will still be uh, undefined on every rank except the root. Okay, so except zero in this case. There's no point inspecting result and seeing what's in it because the answer will be nothing or should be nothing unless you've already declared, uh, you know, given it a value elsewhere. Um, it's just an empty buffer essentially. Um, on the other hand, the send buffer should have something in it on every single rank, uh, including the root, because the root is also taking part in the reduction operation. Okay, it's, it's not that its only role is to collect the data, it is also there to contribute a bit of it um, to the result. So in this case, the reduction operation that's being performed um, on a sing of a single integer is a summation. Uh, so MPI sum is used and it's across the entire um, set of processes, so it's MPI com world. Um, okay, but result is only given a value uh, on rank zero. Okay, so I hope that all makes sense. Now we're going to talk about keys of user defined reduction operators. Um, so I sort of briefly mentioned these earlier. Um, so you're not limited, and I'll scroll back up a bit to here, to the predefined reduction operations. You're not limited to only these predefined reduction operations, okay? You can uh, define your own. And indeed, if you've used your own MPI-derived data type, then you will essentially have to um, implement your own uh, reduction operation, even if it is just a, a summation because uh, MPI won't, well, in fact, C or Fortran won't know what to do with that data type otherwise. Um, okay, but it might also just be that you're doing a more complicated reduction. And that's fine, you can define your own, uh, some arbitrary operator, which we're going to refer to as O, um, henceforth. Uh, so in C, this user-defined function is a function of type MPI underscore user underscore function. Um, and it has a particular, uh, and in fact, this is true of Fortran as well, it has a particular um, uh, formal parameters or set of formal parameters, a particular signature. Uh, some void pointer, which is this input um, vector, some void pointer, which is out or uh, an in and out vector, so it will overwrite that. Um, one which uh, is an integer, which is the length of those vectors, um, and they should be the same. Okay, uh, so that's, that's the equivalent of count when you're performing the reduction operation um, because the reduction operation can always be on some array and it will just perform the re reduction uh, on every element of that array so that would be the input that goes into length here and they should be the same or should all match up um, and uh, the data type as ever for all MPI things uh, and the Fortran uh, version is it is a external subprogram and it has exactly the same essentially um, signature with a, an in vector, an input vector, an in out vector, uh, which is one that will be overwritten but also contains some other data, um, and then length and data type, except that the data type is an integer as ever in Fortran, not a type in and of itself. Um, so there are some rules about how you can define that reduction operator. Uh, so this is, first of all, uh, this thing I already mentioned of it, keeping in mind that your reduction uh, can always take place over some array of, of uh, any given data type or of the data type. Um, so it should be able to, to act in that way so that and it overrides this in-out vector, okay, um, which is kind of 
is probably exactly as you'd expect if you're used to Fortran. Um, is a little more unusual for C. Um, normally there'd be a kind of return and you just have inputs in the signature, but here, you know, you're going to be overwriting it, overwriting that buffer. Um, and it should be the case that the new value for that input output buffer uh, is simply the binary operation of its current element and the same element from the other input vector. Okay, so I hope the syntax of kind of all the pseudocode we put up here makes sense. Um, feel free to ask questions if it doesn't. Uh, and the other important rule um, about this operator is that it needs to be associative. Um, so I appreciate not everyone is a recovering physicist like myself. So I uh, went and found this earlier so I could explain it correctly. Um, the associative property, and this is the mathematical associative property, not associativity from um, caches, for example. Um, so the mathematical property is that the result is the same uh, no matter what sequence the operands happen in, or no matter what sequence the operations happen in. So if I'm adding numbers together, addition is associative um, because it doesn't matter what order you add those numbers up in. Uh, you'll get the same result. And the same is true for the product of, uh, and this is kind of important, of scalars, so of real numbers, um, those are associative, associative operations. Okay, and the important point is it doesn't matter what order that happens in. And the reason that's important for the MPI reduction operator is the thing that I mentioned earlier um, about the fact that under the hood, MPI can, you know, use much smarter um, networks to actually perform this reduction across the entire communicator. And um, that only works because it is associative. If it matters what order those things happen in, um, okay, then it's not possible to do the reduction in that way because it would be different um, depending on the different ways that the network had decided to, to split up the problem on that day. So, uh, that's why it's important that it's associative. Um, okay, it also says that the operator doesn't need to commute. Um, so commuting is, is the property that um, to operate or that the operation is gives the same result in a different, uh, if the operands are in different orders, I uh, know. I have to bring it up. Sorry, if the sequence of operations happens in a different order, uh, no operands, which one's which? <laughs> ah, here we go, yes. So the order in which the operations are performed doesn't matter as long as the sequence of operands is not changed. So that's associativity, commutativity is that changing the order of the operands does not change the result. Okay, so this is a slightly stronger uh, version. Uh, so this says that you can do these calculations in any order at all, and it doesn't matter. Um, associativity simply says, that as long as the sequence of operands is the same, it's preserved, it's okay. Um, and the reason that it's associated, oh, okay, and the reason that Associativity matters when commutativity, uh, commutativity doesn't. In this case, is most likely due due to um, uh, floating point or to the way that computers add numbers up, right? So, um, you know, floating point arithmetic means that uh, these things are never commutative. Um, that must be associative. So hopefully that explanation has helped to not make things worse. <laughs> uh, the main thing to remember is that you, whatever your reduction operator is, it should be important that as long as the order of um, operations is globally preserved, uh, it shouldn't matter if you chunk it up in different ways. Okay, so I can add one and two over here and three and four over there 
and then just add the partial results and it's still okay. I still get the same result um, as long as one, two, three, and four are still in the same order. Um, it doesn't need to be true that if I add one and three and two and four, I still get the same result. That's not important. Um, so most common operations that you can think of and that you'd want to do in a reduction, that will be true. Uh, but just be aware that formally this is the case. Uh, and in my past life as a physicist, I spent a lot of time dealing with um, math that does not commute. So when you multiply two things in different orders, they did not get the same result. And it is every bit as painful as it sounds. Uh, so I go for you there. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of registering those user-defined operators, the process is very similar to that of registering your own user-defined data types. Um, in C, there's a specific type that's defined, um, MPI op. Uh, in Fortran, it's an integer. <laughs> okay, or the, rather the handle uh, to it is. Um, so you have to call MPI op create uh, and also register the function with MPI that you're going to use as your reduction operator. Um, uh, simply with some handle to the function itself. Um, uh, an integer or a logical which indicates whether or not it is a commutative operation. Um, again, which will under which will affect the underlying uh, assumptions that MPI is able to make. Okay, and um, yeah, and then the handle that you should have already defined, but will now uh, assign in the MPI op create. Um, cool. Okay, so you have your function pointer, some logical to say whether or not it commutes, and then the handle that you're going to use to specify uh, to the actual reduction operation. And of course, I error in Fortran. Um, okay, so if I just quickly scroll back here, so this, so your uh, MPI op, um, okay, or op in the Fortran notation, that would fit in to reduce, for example, where MPI sums. Okay, so that's what you would supply to the MPI reduce call. Um, is your custom uh, registered function, uh, but you use its actual handle. So it's MPI op handle that you created and assigned using MPI op create. So there are variants of MPI reduce. And Connor J is asking uh, the tough questions. What sets the ordering if the operator is not commutative? Um, so in that case, let me have a little think about this. Uh, so if it doesn't commute, then MPI will have to make sure. Um, I apologize, I'm going to have to go back to here. Let's check if I get this right. Changing the order of the operands. Right. Okay, yeah. So if it's commutative, then you can change the order of the operands, and that's okay. Uh, and in that case, MPI is a lot more free to choose the order in which um, those uh, processes communicate with each other in which case the partial or the partial reductions are calculated. Um, if it is not commutative, you're right, or oh, Chris, this suggestion is probably right. Uh, well, so if it's not commutative, I would expect that it probably is just based on the rank. Um, on the assumption that because that's an order that you can fix and always be sure of, so 
fundamentally, right, the NPR library wants to optimize as much as it can. So if you tell it uh, this is not a commutative operation, it has to pick an order in which to do it. And the, the one that it can always rely on is simply the order of the ranks. Um, however, if you tell it that it is a commutative operation, it no longer has to worry about keeping the same order and it can look at things like where processes are actually physically located. Um, so if you have, say, on Archer, uh, well, let's do with Cirrus actually because that's, that's what you've been uh, had access to. So on, on Cirrus, you have 36 physical calls uh, on each node. So you might well elect to, to, you know, to launch um, 72 MPI processes across two nodes. If your operation is commutative, then MPI is at liberty to calculate the partial reduction on each node independently and then put them together because it doesn't matter how those ranks are actually distributed across the nodes. Um, on the other hand, if it's not commutative, then you might, then it will have to stick to, for example, rank ordering. Um, and that might be, and that might lead to the situation where it still calculates the partial reduction. Um, on each node independently, and then communicates across nodes, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so yes, and, and yeah, so you're right, Chris. Um, I hope that makes sense, Connor. I appreciate this is <laughs> not the simplest thing to, to to get into detail on, but that's a good question, um, and I don't know for sure that it would simply be based on on the rank. Okay, but that would be. The most sensible thing I can think of for it to do, um, but as ever, the aim is for MPI to let you give it the information it needs to um, make sort of dangerous optimizations if it can. Um, yeah. Okay, you're welcome, Connor. Um, so yeah, I, the the reason that uh, I've tried to go um, more slowly. <laughs> through this collective communications uh, lecture and I have some of the previous ones and a lot of the reason for that is that um, things about ordering are confusing um, and the counts are confusing um, or at least I think so you might be thinking no oh, this is all easy but <laughs> hopefully I've managed to make it all make a certain amount of sense um, there are variants of MPI reduce available. So there is an MPI all reduce in which there is no root process. Um, and that simply, uh, so an equivalent thing to an all reduce would be to do an MPI reduce followed by an MPI broadcast of the result. Okay, don't do that because that's much less efficient. The MPI all reduce um, does that for you. Okay, uh, so it's equivalent in the same way that a non-blocking communication for the immediately power weight is equivalent to a, a blocking communication. Um, so an NPI or reduce, every process gets the uh, reduced result. Um, MPI reduce scatter is an even more niche one in which the result is then scattered. Well, okay, so all reduce isn't really that niche. <laughs> um, uh, and again, uh, so another thing I should say actually as well, for, for all reduce, it's even more important, however, that the MPI library is able to do some kind of optimization of how that reduction happens. Um, because you need to suddenly, you know, complete well, compute partial reductions everywhere, but also share those results back. Um, and there are more efficient ways of doing that than, than the naive case of simply performing a reduction and then broadcasting. Um, but again, then it will make a real big difference as well whether or not your operator is commutative or not. Um, so I think ignore what I was saying about uh, floating point arithmetic. I think MPI doesn't care about that that level of it. Um, it will probably just assume that MPI sum, for example, is always commutative, um, and MPI prod, uh, so the, the product, the global product, is always commutative, and won't worry about the implications of um, uh, floating point arithmetic there because then the result will be different but only very slightly. Um, okay. 
So, um, I diverted again now. MPI reduce scatter, uh, it'll calculate the reduction and then scatter the result back to all processes. Um, yeah, it does exactly what it says in the tin, really. Uh, MPI scan, uh, so the, the, the explainer here is parallel prefix. Um, so I'll, I'll be honest with you, I had to look up <laughs> what that meant. Turns out that prefix and scan are both uh, terms used in computer science uh, to refer to what I would call a cumulative sum. Uh, so there it is, it is calculating cumulative sum across processes uh, in rank order um, of some particular uh, variable or array. Um, so we'll have a look at some diagrams and some some syntax for these. So they all reduce, um, you know, as I explained, is going to calculate the reduction. Uh, but now, whereas in a in a single MPI reduce only one root process gets the result that's filled in, uh, now they all do. Um, but all the same rules apply. All processes have to call it, and they all have to have buffers set aside. Uh, they will all actually be used now. Uh, is the difference? Um, okay, and so Chris has been over to MPI forum and handled the search documentation for us, and has found a bit that says users may define operations that are assumed to be associative but not commutative. The canonical evaluation order reduction is determined by the ranks of the processes in the group. However, the implementation can take advantage of associativity or associativity and commutativity in order to change the order of evaluation. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to look that up, Chris. That's helpful. Um, and I think it means that I was saying the right thing, <laughs> which is nice for me. So essentially, if your operator is commutative, okay, it will just the MPI implementation is free to take advantage of any optimization it likes in the ordering of those broken leg reduction operations. Um, however, if it's not commutative, then it will just do it in rank order. Uh, that may be important for reproducibility reasons as well. Um, now that I'm thinking about it more. So for example, if you are a sort of person that's introduced, interested in bit reproducibility, the only way to ensure that uh, with a reduction operation of any kind would be to make sure that that reduction always happened in the same order. Okay, so then you would have to specify that it was a non-commuting operator in order to make that happen. But thank you very much, Chris, for, for looking that up. Great. Um, so, all reduce. Uh, it's more or less as you'd expect, a send buffer and a receive buffer and a count. Uh, the count should be the size of both the send buffer and the receive buffer here, um, because again, it will just do an element-wise reduction of an array if it is an array. Um, uh, and every process will end up with something in its receive buffer. Uh, as MPI data type specifies, the operator for reduction um, and the communicator across which the reduction is taking place. Um, all more or less as you'd expect. The only difference here between this and MPI reduce is that there's no root process specified. Um, again, it's MPI scan, uh, which is the cumulative sum. Uh, now again, okay, and here it's a little bit trickier to think about as well, the difference between simply doing this with a, a scalar, so a single value or an array of values. Uh, it will calculate the cumulative sum uh, in rank order, but of every element in that array. Okay, not the sum across the array, but the sum of individual elements in that array. Um, so rank zero will simply have uh, some initial set of values, and then rank one will have the sum of rank zeros plus rank ones uh, in each element, uh, and so on. So the, the lettering here down the middle of this diagram indicates the um, reduction at each stage for just the first element. So if rank zero has a, um, let's assume the operator is a plus for simplicity. So rank one has a plus e, uh, rank two has a plus e plus i, 
and rank three has a plus e plus i plus n. Okay, and a scan is just a cumulative um, sum operation. Uh, okay, and it has a send buffer, a receive buffer, and a count, all of which are as they are with the reduction operation, other reduction operations. Um, has a data type and operation and communicator. It has all the things that you've expected to. It's just doing something slightly different. Um, and again, the fact that uh, so this obviously has a certain order to it, um, but there are optimizations that you could make by the time you get up to many, many processes, and you to expect the MPI libraries to make. Um, okay. There we go. Okay, and that, that does bring us to the end <laughs> of, of the lecture material anyway. Um, so we'll quickly have a look at exercise five. Uh, as I said before, you don't, you're not under any particular obligation to complete these exercises with the possible exception if you do want um, or you do need uh, a certificate of attendance. Uh, we will ask you um, to submit uh, a, a sort of a pi calculation based um, solution just to just to show that you were here for at least some of the course uh, but otherwise it's, it's completely up to you whether or not you're paying attention to these but you are also free to to do them on Cirrus uh, as well as just your own laptop or computer um, and you should have Cirrus accounts for I think a couple of weeks after the end of this course so after today uh, and you'll be warned before they are uh, removed but you should transfer all your data off before that happens if you wish to keep any of it. Um, so exercise five uh, on the sheet is simply the round the ring um, problem that we looked at already, but now we want to do it with an MPI reduction operation rather than point to point. Um, okay, and you can look at how so one thing that's certainly interesting to look at actually is how the execution time uh, varies with the number of processes and how it compares to the point-to-point -point implementation. Uh, we won't have a chance to, to go through this um, uh, separately because this is the last session. But what I would expect to see is that your point-to-point -point implementation does increasingly badly compared with the uh, reduction operation um, as the number of processes goes up. Um, I would hope to see that. Otherwise, we have an issue with our collective communications. <laughs> there's a few extra things you can look at here. Here's a wish. And of course, there are, there's even more. So I briefly mentioned earlier that there are special communicators you can create, which will allow you to do things like calculate neighbors easily. Um, one of those is a Cartesian communicator. So there's a little bit of extra stuff um, in this exercise sheet because it is just the same one we use for our master's course. Um, so you may wish to have a little look at that as well if uh, if you're interested. Um, okay. Other than that, we're now into the general Q and A. Um, thank you all very much for attending, and I hope you've enjoyed the course and I hope it's been useful. <laughs>